Good evening. Welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, for a book launch and discussion for Jose Antonio's, uh, if I can say, give an early plug, very readable, very thorough, and actually uh, original uh, book on Latin American uh, development since independence. Um, you all have the bios in front of you. I won't bother reading from them, but uh, what we'll do is uh, first... Uh, Jose Antonio will talk uh, for about 15 minutes about his book, and then we'll sit down and uh, we'll be joined with comments by George Gray Molina and a discussion, then we'll open it up for comments. Just briefly uh, on the book and on Jose Antonio Ocampo, uh, as you see in his bio, this is an incredibly distinguished career as an economist. Um, he is now professor of practice and uh, concentration director for uh, the uh, Program of Economic and Political Development at Columbia University. Uh, before that, he was Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Development at the United Nations. He's been head of ECLAC. He served in the Colombian government. Uh, but I think most important, actually, is that he's an incredibly uh, humble man. Uh, he is, uh, despite all those accomplishments, he's a very accomplished uh, and serious economist, but he's just a really good guy, um, I can say, having worked with him in a number of capacities. And one of the sort of signs... We had him write once for America's Quarterly, and uh, the idea was a sort of a face-off about the reforms, uh, economic reforms underway in Cuba. And uh, on the one side was a Cuban economist who was defending the economic reforms that the Castro regime was putting forward, and Jose Antonio. And, and Jose Antonio went through and sort of named all the different problems and sort of the bottlenecks of the reforms. But his, his conclusion was, be careful, because you're going to lose the gains of the Cuban Revolution. I thought that was just an interesting way, in a very heartfelt way, to uh, you know, add a warning uh, to the process of reforms we're seeing in Cuba right now. Is that you don't want them to create inequality. There are things you want to preserve, and I think throughout all of his research and his time as an economist at the UN and now in Colombia, this idea that um, equality, uh, economic opportunity, uh, is really one of the fundamental goals of development has really run through, and it's uh, shot through very much in this book, which looks at the history of economic development, but also looking at the root causes of inequality, the human effect of volatility, and the ways in which uh, economic inequality continues to remain a hindrance for economic growth in the region. It remains one of the fundamental challenges. As I mentioned, George Gray Molina will be our discussant tonight. Uh, George Gray Molina is the uh, chief economist at the regional bureau, uh, Latin American Regional Bureau at the UNDP. Uh, he headed the uh, Bolivia unit of the human development report by the UNDP. Uh, he's an, he's uh, an economist by training uh, from Oxford University and uh, did his bachelor's degree at Cornell. Um, and without further ado, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Jose Antonio to uh, walk us through a little bit of his book. I will say this as he walks up here. It's, um, it's one of those books, if you, I teach also at Columbia, and I was realizing in reading it, it's one of the books I probably want to assign to my students. It's one of those ones I'll sort of preserve to myself and use for my own notes and not let my students realize that I'm lecturing from it, because it has a lot of good kernels that I don't want to have my students know and make them think that I know all this. Thanks. Well, <clears throat> well let me uh, start by thanking you, Chris, for the invitation to, uh, uh, to be uh, here today, the Council of the Americas, and of course to George uh, for um, agreeing to uh, uh, to comment uh, uh, the book. Um, uh, let me say for the first 15 minutes, which I'm expected to talk, I cannot summarize <laughs> this whole book, <laughs> uh, you know, which covers uh, uh, 200 years and a continent. So, it's, uh, so let, me, let me actually um, uh, just uh, reflect on, the, on a few issues that, that I think uh, I find interesting. First of all, uh, you know, the, the book uh, really tries to uh, to present a view on, on the major questions uh, regarding the uh, economic development of Latin America, uh, particularly the roots of inequality and the effects uh, uh, inequalities have. Uh, the second, uh, in the, the big question, when, when did Latin America f fall behind uh, in, uh, in history? Uh, and in that regard, what has been the role of, uh, uh, of policies adopted by Latin America, as well as international events uh, that have uh, affected Latin America. The, the book, uh, in, uh, in, in trying to answer these questions, takes, uh, a, uh, let's say, a, a conceptual framework 
uh, that first of all recognizes that the uh, that the uh, you know the, the the mix of two major factors uh, have been the uh, behind the uh, not only the history of Latin America but the differentiation among Latin American countries uh, through history. Uh, the first of, the first uh, of them is the uh, you can say the colonial legacy uh, associated to the uh, particularly to what we call labor institutions uh, or labor relations. Uh, so the uh, the way the the uh, Indians were associated with the uh, uh, Spanish uh, colonial system, but also, of course, slavery in other countries, and the many pockets, uh, you know, more than uh, you, can, you can think of, uh, of, uh, you know, let's say, white labor, uh, you know, a smallholder that developed in certain parts of, of Latin America. In the history of Costa Rica, in the history of the tobacco region of Cuba, in the history uh, of uh, Uruguay and, and, uh, and uh, Argentina from early on. Uh, and of course, uh, this will become much more important with the massive migration uh, to some countries uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. So you have these pockets of white labor uh, and uh, which develop, let's say, more equal relations than, than those regions uh, uh, where uh, Indian, uh, Indians and uh, uh, and slaves pre predominated. And of course, the, uh, uh, the, the second factor is uh, the way uh, different ec uh, uh, economies related to the world economy. We can think uh, going back to the 19th century uh, is whether they specialize uh, in, uh, in mining products, uh, in tropical agricultural products, uh, or in uh, a, a temperate zone agricultural products. And they, they do have a totally different story that I know is I cannot summarize, uh, you know, briefly today, but but the uh, the differentiation of countries uh, really has uh, is associated to the mix of these two factors. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the the book uses a periodization, which is uh, I would say fairly standard, or, although we might co-author, we discuss it, uh, quite a bit the turning points, uh, which is uh, correct because they are not the same for every country. So it's. Uh, uh, it's, it's not easy to, to say, but the, uh, uh, we, we, we call the, uh, the first uh, uh, the post-independence period, which is uh, a period of a state building uh, in most countries, uh, not in Brazil, which is the country that inherits uh, the imperial system uh, as, uh, as the colonial, uh, as the, the, uh, the emperor uh, moves to Brazil with the Mexican, uh, uh, with the Napoleonic uh, wars. Uh, but the uh, uh, but in the Spanish American for sure. Uh, so the state building is a, is a very uh, conflicted process and and, and uh, very difficult for some countries. Let's say notably Mexico. Uh, uh, the second period is the export age, uh, which we broadly say covers from 1870 uh, to 1929. Uh, then a third period, which uh, we call a state-led industrialization and. And this, we, we use a totally different concept uh, to the concept of import substitution industrialization, which is the, uh, the one that has prevailed in the uh, historical literature. Uh, and this because uh, uh, we think import substitution doesn't quite capture uh, what was going on during this period. Uh, it's more the state and industrialization. So the importance of the state as a, as a uh, leader of growth, let's say, and uh, secondly, great uh, relevance given to industrialization as the, as the engine of growth. And finally, the period of market reforms uh, since 1980, uh, uh, which is the period in which we, are, we still uh, live. Now, so uh, regarding, for example, the question of uh, when did Latin America uh, fall behind, uh, and when, uh, it is quite clear that the two periods in which Latin America has done the worst is the first and the last. Uh, so the period of post-independence was traumatic in, uh, in uh, most economies, not in all economies, let's say Chile or Costa Rica, uh, or Cuba, which of course r uh, remained a colony during that period, uh, did relatively well, uh, while Mexico uh, did relatively bad or, uh, and many other uh, economies. Uh, and, uh, also, and very importantly, uh, the, uh, since 1980, in which Latin America has actually fallen behind uh, the, uh, 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 slightly in relation to the, uh, to the uh, 
uh, industrial world, but particularly in relation to Asia, uh, which has been uh, a, a growing at very fast rates. And this comes clearly in uh, our analysis of the share of Latin America in world GDP, the world gross domestic product. Uh, according to our numbers, let's say, uh, that share increases from 2.6% in 1870, almost constantly until 1980, uh, when it reaches 9.5%. Uh, and then it starts to fall. Uh, it falls, uh, of course, dramatically during the uh, 1980s, during the last decade of development to 8%. But then it continues to fall, basically, because Latin America uh, is unable to... Uh, to catch up with the uh, very rapid process of development of Asia. Um, now, within, within that, those categories, there are other, uh, I think, interesting and, and novel observations. Uh, I'll start with, uh, with one thing that, uh, uh, that, as far as I know, had never been observed uh, relating to Latin America long-term development patterns, and is the, the frequency of, uh, of a, a country experiences of rapid growth, followed by also uh, during long periods of time, followed by relatively slow growth or, or, or even reductions uh, in, uh, uh, in economic development for also long periods of time. Uh, and you can go, uh, I mean, the first actually remarkable case is Cuba. Uh, Cuba uh, was one of the most advanced economies uh, by the time of the First World War, and then it had a long term stagnation that lasted until the Cuban Revolution and even beyond the Cuban Revolution. Um, and then next come the, uh, the southern countries, uh, Argentina in particular, but also Uruguay and Chile, which were the other three leaders of Latin America at the time of the First World War and, and the Second World War. And then they have a, 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 a very slow growth uh, for several decades uh, after. I mean, Chile, of course, becomes a, a new success story uh, in the 1990s, but in, in between, uh, it was really a slow growing uh, economy. Uh, then you can say comes uh, Venezuela. Venezuela was this, the most rapidly uh, growing economy of Latin America from the 1920s to the 1960s. Uh, but then since the light, late 1970s, it has essentially extenuated uh, uh, with you know, very uh, strong business cycles. Um, uh, and then you can, of course, say that it's the story of Brazil and Mexico, uh, very rapidly growing economies from about 1940 to, or even 1930 uh, to 1980, uh, and then uh, have been a slow growing economies, uh, you know, you take the 1980 to the present time. Um, in, uh, in that story, actually, uh, it's interesting that, uh, as we point out, that there is only one economy that, uh, that does not have very long periods of rapid growth, but doesn't have a periods of a slow growth either, which is Colombia. Colombia is actually remarkable because of its stability. And then two small economies which do relatively well in the long term, uh, which are uh, uh, Costa Rica and Panama, uh, which you know, have a very a more stable pattern of economic growth in the long term. Within that story, uh, there are also, uh, you know, uh, very interesting uh, in observations uh, uh, that I will use, uh, introduce uh, as uh, titles. Let's say the uh, uh, Latin American protectionism comes much earlier than the Great Depression uh, of the 1930s. It's actually uh, very entrenched uh, since the late 19th century, at least in most of the larger economies. Uh, and, and, uh, and it shows a, a very particular uh, story uh, in which the, uh, they say the business class uh, was uh, equally good betting on export development or betting on production for the domestic market. There was no, uh, you know, the, the traditional view that, you know, is either export development or domestic market uh, just comes to be uh, a bad description uh, of uh, development patterns in that period. Then, of course, uh, Latin America uh, uh, starts to look inward, and our view in that regard is that it's forced by the international economy rather than by choice. Uh, the, uh, the succession of shocks, uh, starting with the First World War, but particularly the 1930s and the Second World War, uh, that uh, uh, convinces Latin America that the domestic market is a real opportunity. And then, of course, uh, it is relatively successful, and in the uh, post-world period, uh, continues to look inward um, and probably too much. Um, now, um, the transition to the uh, uh, 
to the market reforms, uh, we characterize as, a, a, again, as a, as a transition force by another major international shock, which is the, uh, the debt crisis uh, a, of the 1980s, which is an international event, not only a Latin American event. Um, a, is the, in a sense, it's the first of, of the succession of major uh, financial crises that the world has experienced uh, since then. Uh, and, a, and our observation uh, on that period for Latin America, you know, broadly speaking, is Latin America has been relatively successful in integrated in the global economy, but has <coughs> not been as successful uh, in subs you know, extracting uh, rapid growth from that. So in that, in that regard, it has been you know, much less successful uh, than, uh, than Asia. Um, now, uh, finally, uh, in relation to the issues of uh, human development and inequality, which we uh, dealt with uh, uh, with the evidence that, uh, that there is, uh, uh, let me uh, start by saying that uh, our appreciation uh, is not only that, it's not that the uh, inequality is a colonial legacy, it's actually a Republican construction. Uh, so that the uh, Republican governments uh, did very little to, uh, uh, to uh, reverse uh, the inequality trends on the low levels of human development. And, and you can say, broadly speaking, uh, that Latin America was between seven decades and 10 decades, or so that is a century, behind uh, in indicators of health of education uh, so it was a significant uh, lag uh, in the development of education and health. Um, uh, in that regard, however, the, uh, the major advance uh, in human development relative to the industrial countries takes place essentially from the 1940s to 1980. So during this period that we call a state-led industrialization, is the big, uh, you know, is the most important catching up, and, the, and it's only a partial catching up. Um, uh, now. Uh, what can we say about poverty reduction and income distribution? Uh, in poverty reduction, um, uh, we essentially say that the, uh, the most important advances uh, were done, let's say, from 1950 to 1980 on, in, the, in the 20th century, uh, and uh, in the, actually in the last 10 years. Uh, so since 2003, we have had one of the major advances in poverty reduction. Uh, now, uh, and the, and the major reversal uh, is the period that uh, we call the lost quarter century, uh, not the lost decade, uh, because it, the period starts in 1980. But the levels of poverty of Latin America of 1980 and are only surpassed in 2004. So we actually had a lost quarter century in terms of poverty reduction uh, in the region. Now, um, what does that reflect in terms of, a, a, of income distribution? Um, a, the, uh, a, the evidence that we have that is partial, you know, a, a, does indicate a, that there were some periods in which there is a major uh, a worsening of income distribution. Uh, and those are the, uh, the what, what we call the first globalization, that is the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, the lost quarter century, uh, and, um, and, and the a factor that weighs on, on most economies, in fact, on all economies except for the southern con countries, which are uh, the economies where uh, labor scarcity uh, is, uh, is, more is clearer uh, early on, is the, uh, the weight of, of, uh, of labor uh, surpluses the, of the, uh, from the rural areas. Now, there are also positive equity shocks some of which are not uh, uh, generally recognized. Uh, the first one, uh, as we point out, is the abolition of slavery, uh, which is early uh, in most of Latin America with two major exceptions, which are Brazil and Cuba. Uh, and Brazil and Cuba, interestingly, because they don't have a revolutionary rupture, um, uh, at the, uh, where uh, the independence wars were really the uh, major source of the, uh, the uh, decline of the slavery uh, in the rest of, uh, of Spanish America. Uh, uh, with a great lack, uh, we also say that the, uh, the, uh, uh, another major uh, improvement, which is more a 20th century improvement, uh, is the uh, elimination or the erosion of what we call the rural servitude, all the systems of uh, subordination of labor in the rural areas. Uh, that is the result of two major processes. The, the first uh, is urbanization. Uh, which gives uh, the, uh, the, 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 
the, the rural poor an opportunity uh, uh, for equality that, you know, of, of, of a kind uh, that was not available in rural areas. And very interestingly, we point out that the agrarian reforms in Latin America were not very extensive. They were you know, a little more extensive in Mexico and Bolivia in particular, uh, to a lesser extent in Chile in, uh, um, uh, and Peru, let's say, but very limited elsewhere. Uh, but we say that everywhere uh, uh, agrarian reform did help to erode uh, uh, the relations of servitude in rural areas. Uh, so uh, as, as, a, you know, as a legal uh, framework in which the, uh, the rural population could work. Uh, then, of course, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the role of labor unions in the Southern Cone, which is a, is a, a positive force for improvements in income distribution, let's say, from the 1940s to the 1960s, uh, uh, until the dictatorships of the 1970s uh, reversed the improvements in income distribution that they experienced. And there are other countries that also experience improvements in income distribution at some stage, and this is now a, a bit forgotten, but you know, from the mid 1960s or uh, to 1980, there is improvement in income distribution in at least the, I mean, of the few countries that we know of in the Costa Rica, in Mexico, in Colombia, and in Venezuela. So, that the, uh, so the, the, the recent improvement in income distribution, they say, it has presence in several economies at different periods of time. And finally, um, uh, on regional inequalities, uh, first of all, it is quite clear that the, uh, <coughs> the regional inequalities are not as high as in other regions of the world. For example, Asia is much more uh, unequal among countries uh, uh, than Latin America. But still, there are huge differences uh, in inequalities. Uh, and the, the, the largest difference were actually built up during the export age of the late 19th and early 20th century. So by the early 20th century, there were four economies that were uh, far uh, ahead of the rest, which were Argentina, uh, Uruguay, Chile, and Cuba, uh, which was one of the leaders of uh, Latin America by the early 20th century. I mean, interestingly, those four economies are the ones that do the, the, uh, the worst <laughs> in the following period. So there is a sort of regional equalization uh, uh, or convergence, as, as we economists call it, uh, that takes place uh, through uh, most of the state-led industrialization period. Uh, in the in more recent decades, there is, seems to be a new divergence, uh, so increasing inequalities across the region, but they are not as marked as what we experienced in the late 19th and early 20th century. Let me leave it at here and, uh, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, George, I have a couple comments myself. Why don't we hear your thoughts? <laughs> well, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris, and thank you, Jose Antonio, for the honor of making some brief comments. Uh, I was very intimidated at first when I received the book because the, the back cover has uh, um, incredible comments by the, the leaders in the field, James Robinson, Rosemary Thorpe, John Coatsworth. Uh, but I was very proud to find that we have a new addition to this club who is a Latin American and brings a voice so, sound in policy and also with a deep historical uh, recognition of, of his own history of Colombia and the way to look at Latin America from a Latin American perspective. So I'm very proud for that. I just wanted to focus on two, two big comments. Uh, one has to do with a big narrative, with, the, with sort of the general idea that's driving the book. This is a uh, 200 years of economic history compressed in 267 pages. So it's a very <laughs> fast read. There's a lot going on. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to try to spell that out. And then follow up with a couple of internal debates, things that Cepalinos debate, and I think that are fascinating that we must learn from, uh, from the past uh, few decades. So on the grand narrative, uh, I think one of the, the important things that is going on in the past 20 years in economic history is that economists who are trained uh, not in history, but in empirics and econometrics and in statistics, tend to look at uh, present day success and think of then, uh, project reverse engineering, do reverse engineering back into the past and try to figure out what the deep cause of that success is. I think that Jose Antonio and Luis uh, in this book say that that's probably the wrong way of looking at it because the themes that, uh, of economic growth and economic change are different for different periods of history. So then 1810, the big concern is state and nation building. It's not economic growth. It's not GDP per capita. 
1870, it has to do with integration into the global economy and the creation of tariffs and revenues uh, to, to create some cohesion in the liberal period. In the 1930s, it's about volatility and insecurity and state-led industrialization uh, as a response to that. In the 1980s, it's a collapse, uh, balance of payments crisis, debt crisis, and the creation of a uh, new set of policies. So in each of these periods, economic growth is not necessarily the objective function of policymakers. It's not the key idea, and that's sort of the question, but the answer uh, is not in a single set of drivers either. It's not about institutions, it's not just about geography. There are no deep drivers of development. And I think what they find uh, very convincingly in the different chapters is that we get a configuration of different drivers uh, and a different set of explanations for each period. Uh, there's two sets of drivers uh, that I think they focus mostly on in the book, and I think uh, they tell a story of a mismatch, uh, a mismatch that leads to inequality and volatility, and it's this. Uh, the export-oriented economies of the 1800s, uh, the early 1900s in Latin America are based on institutions that focus on uh, commodity exports, natural resources, very much oriented towards the needs of the elites, uh, fragile states and fragile elites of those, of those economies. Um, the other driver is labor markets, and the creation of labor markets in, in Latin America, as you know, is, is incomplete. Today we still have 50% of the economies that are informal. Uh, we still have uh, an internal frontier, if you will, uh, within our labor markets that hasn't been resolved by massive rural to urban migration or massive uh, insertion of women to the labor force. So these two drivers, the domestic one that speaks of incomplete labor markets and the external one that focuses on what we can do as commodity exporters in the global economy, they are mismatched over about two centuries. And this mismatch has a great cost to our economies and societies uh, that devolves into uh, inequality and of course volatility. I think that's sort of the grand narrative that uh, the book uh, uh, sort of delivers to us in a way that's very nuanced and is very uh, not, not academic but historical. Uh, two small debates that are interesting t for economists and people who are following uh, the, the CEPAL debates. Uh, Jose Antonio was the ECLAC secretary uh, for a decade. Um, he revisits some, one of the classic debates of Prebish and Singer about terms of trade, and I recommend that chapter <coughs> and that portion because he provides new data, 70-year span to look at terms of trade and how that has changed and how, how that story is actually true when we look at it with hindsight and with this new series of data. So that's one thing that I caught my attention very much. The second one is the discussion of social convergence and economic convergence. Um, and I think Jose Antonio just elaborated on that. The gist of the story is that we, we started to converge um, in accelerated manner during the state-led industrial period from 1930s to the 1970s economically. But the social convergence was a lot slower. And the social convergence is a lot slower, I think, because that process is driven by uh, slow and cumulative process that start with migration, um, drops in fertility levels for women, education, expansion of the labor force, processes that take 40 or 50 years to bear fruit. And I think that just recently, in the past 20 or 30 years, we're seeing that that social convergence is speeding, and we see an acceleration of that rate of convergence. And actually, when you look at the figures today, uh, there was a launch of the Human Development Report at the global level. The highest convergers the social, uh, on the social side in Latin America are not the ones that you would think they are. They're uh, El Salvador, Guyana, Ecuador, Bolivia, the highest rates of social convergence over the past three decades. Uh, the highest economic convergence rates are, of course, the high growers, uh, Chile, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, Panama. It's two different sets of economies, two different sets of societies that show different rhythms of development. So I think that comes out very well in the discussion on social and economic convergence. And just one final uh, issue is that this book brings in something that is badly needed in economic history in Latin America, which is the international comparison, the, the comparison with Asia and with other regions. And just two points on that. When we look at the Asian story, um, the, sort of the standard story is about the flying geese, the fact that there was Japan 40, 50 years ago, and then Korea, and then uh, so on until we hit China and then the following emerging economies. Well, Jose Antonio's book describes the, fl the flying geese of Latin America, uh, but that has a different outcome. It starts with Cuba a century ago. It's, it goes on to Venezuela in the 1930s, Brazil, Argentina in the 1950s, but all of those plateau and their rates of growth and their rates of prosperity decline. So the question that we must ask is, well, why does that happen? Why are the flying geese of Latin America on the ground? And I think that he uh, addresses what today is called 
uh, the literature on the middle income track saying Latin America doesn't have a high wage problem, it has a productivity problem. It has a problem with inequality. It has a problem with high informal sectors in its labor market. And these structural issues must be attacked uh, with structural measures. We can't do, we won't be able to accomplish much with more of the same. Uh, the final thing that I think is very interesting about this whole discussion is that there's contrast between the academic and historical literature. Uh, the, the Spence Commission that just uh, brought, uh, brought together Nobel uh, prize winners a few years ago concluded after deliberating for about six months that they really didn't know what the causes of economic growth were. And I think that Jose Antonio is telling us we, we, we know what the causes of economic growth are, but they're historically defined. They have to do, we have to talk about the 1930s and the 1960s and understand how politics, institutions, and economies are brought together. So I think that's very refreshing for the next generation of economists who are looking at at the same problem. So I'll stop here. It's a great honor to, to read the book and also to share these thoughts. Well, thanks. I'll give you a chance to respond, Jose Antonio, but let me just put out a few questions now. Um, we'll, we'll sort of look backwards and then look forwards too, because I, you know, I'm going to take you a little bit out of your comfort zone, because I know this is a book on economic history, but I wanted you to sort of draw some of the conclusions and, and look forward. Um, but first, let's, let's take this issue of sort of how George has represented your book in terms of you know, identifying different segments and different drivers of economic growth. What, what, what would you, I mean, what's your response to this and what do you think are the drivers today of economic growth? Well, I, I think there are, uh, I think George uh, pointed out that, uh, two things. I mean, the, the first one and the, uh, I would say the, the major problem is still for Latin America, uh, uh, which has actually worsened in our view in the last uh, three decades since the uh, 1980. Uh, is uh, the technological uh, gap that we had built up. So it is quite clear that uh, when uh, you compare, and, and the comparisons are in the book, uh, Latin America with the two reference groups that we could have, uh, which are uh, East Asia, uh, but also the, uh, let's say, the industrial countries, the developed countries that are, are rich in natural resources. Let's say the Canadas, Australias, New Zealands, uh, Norways, or, uh, or the world. Now, the, uh, in, uh, in relation to both of them, uh, uh, there is a significant technological gap. And I would say uh, our explanation in the book of why uh, there is this uh, sort of middle income uh, trap that, that you know, the countries go up to a certain level, and, uh, but they don't continue to go up, let's say they stagnate in the middle class of the world, uh, is that they have not invested enough in technological catching up. Uh, so I think that's one point. The other problem, the other issue is uh, this issue that uh, uh, George called the social convergence. And I think this is a, a interesting. I think the, we are going uh, through a period which is very interesting uh, and gives a lot of opportunities in that regard, which in my view is the coincidence of the uh, lag effect of the demographic transition. Uh, so the, you know, Latin America's population is not growing uh, as fast. So there is this uh, opportunity uh, 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 generated by, by the demographic transition in which basically uh, you know, the uh, dependent age groups are growing very slowly. There is the ch children and the uh, older uh, population. So the, the productive population uh, people or, or, or population in the productive age uh, is uh, still growing relatively fast. Uh, and I think that gives an opportunity to increase per capita income uh, relatively well. Mix with improvements of education, uh, which is, uh, is a long-term process, and it's one of the dimensions in which there was never a lost decade. You can see that education continued to, to improve, in, uh, to expand in Latin America, even in the 1980s, and certainly in the last two decades. Uh, so by now, we, we have a, a, a growing scarcity of, of not unskilled labor. And, uh, and I think that has given an opportunity uh, f uh, for, you know, for improvements in social conditions that I think are behind the positive social trends that Latin America has experienced over the uh, last decade. So we, I would say my, let's say my balance is on the social side, we are doing relatively well. On the economic side, we really have to do a major uh, effort at uh, developing innovation systems, uh, which are uh, lagging significantly behind in a sense. Uh, worse than was true during the industrialization age, in which Latin America was building up 
uh, a, a technological system that is now uh, relatively gone. I think that's the balance between the two factors. So let me ask a question, because you, what you're implying, both of you, is that there are so basically, there's a divergence between the two convergences, if I can sort of, and that there's a social mm -hmm. convergence, and, but that's different than the countries that are experiencing the economic convergence. What is, happens in this discrepancy? I mean, is there inherent conflict or, or even sort of a, a does, I mean, over the long term, if we can project this forward, are we talking about you know, growing divergences within the region? Are we talking about ongoing social um, lags in, in the economically converging countries or vice versa? Yeah, actually the countries that are, are moving forward in, in the two dimensions are sometimes quite different. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, George correctly pointed out that Bolivia, for example, has been uh, uh, an important in, in terms of uh, driving uh, social convergence. Um, uh, but there are other countries that it may be, uh, Peru, for example, is, is a country that is now uh, growing, you know, growing relatively fast. Panama is the fastest growing Latin American economy today. Uh, uh, and, but they are not improving as much uh, in, in social terms. So you, you have a, the, the two forces really are playing out differently. But for the whole region, uh, I would say the, um, uh, the, uh, the issue of, of the te technological lag is really uh, a, a dominant. Uh, for some countries, particularly South America, uh, it doesn't seem to wait as much uh, for one basic reason, because we have an exceptional level of commodity prices. Mm -hmm. So the exceptional level of commodity prices of the last 10 years is the factor that, in, uh, in my view, uh, is the major source of rapid growth of South America. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, you can say uh, history has taught us that the booms of commodity prices don't last forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and if Latin America doesn't invest uh, uh, the, its uh, resources in, uh, in new sectors that uh, will survive after the commodity boom, uh, then the commodity boom will, en and in uh, will end up with frustration. You know, I actually like very much this uh, concept that the Venezuelans developed in the 1940s, which they call sembrar el petróleo, you know, to, uh, to seed the oil, uh, which I actually is a, is a very nice concept. Uh, uh, let me say, we are not seeding the oil. Yeah. Well, what was interesting <laughs> is you have a table on, on sort of re export diversification uh, by country over time. And w when you aggregate the whole region, you definitely see a trend towards more value-added products, merchandise, even sort of high-tech. When you disaggregate by country, you see Mexico is clearly leading the pack, um, really in a disproportionate share of higher-end exports, whereas countries like Venezuela and even uh, Argentina have actually, commodities are representing a larger share of their exports than they did, uh, say, even in the 1950s and 60s. What do you think this means in terms of, and you, you talk favorably about Raul Prebisch's thesis of declining terms of trade and booms and busts, bust, inherent volatility. What does this mean, do you think, for some of these countries that have, for reasons of, of uh, you know, contraction of their own export sector, of manufacturing for reasons of globalization and the reliance on commodities, what does this mean for their long-term prospects? And I mean this for both of you, actually. Yeah, uh, I, w I will say the following. Uh, during this industrialization period, uh, I, I think the, uh, it was quite correct to focus on manufacturing. Uh, actually, manufacturing and modern services, because people uh, tend to forget that during that period is when uh, uh, we developed the electricity network, the uh, telecommunication networks, the urban uh, water and sewage systems. I mean, that, that was really important engines of growth. Uh, and in, in a way, the, uh, or the we didn't, we were not very successful overall in the financial sectors. Uh, anyway, so the, the, uh, the state-led industrialization was manufacturing plus these other modern services, as we call it, okay? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, I, I think uh, today uh, is uh, the, uh, let's say that is not a good uh, representation. Uh, so uh, we said we have to bet on, on sectors that have higher technological contents. Now, those sectors could be uh, in many places. Some are not in manufacturing, for example, um, in this, uh, in, in, uh, 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 they are, for instance, in services. For, for instance, it's, it may be a better bet for some countries to invest in, in, uh, in developing the exports of health uh, services, uh, which is a, you know, a, a sector with a, a lot of uh, professional capacities today, uh, and in which several countries actually have of Latin America have a relatively good uh, comparative advantage. 
Um, uh, uh, well, financial services for the countries. Panama is, of course, uh, uh, booming because of the mix of financial services on the, uh, on the second uh, canal, let's say, uh, so that you know, they have, let's say, a boom associated to, to services. Uh, now, uh, not tourist services, because generally speaking, tourist services are not high, you know, high uh, uh, technological services. Uh, in, uh, in natural resources, you could also have uh, in interesting opportunities. I mean, the soybeans revolution of, of um, Argentina uh, and, uh, and Brazil is, has a huge technological contents. I mean, you can say that you know, it's not just natural resources. It's, it's a, the technology associated to the, uh, to the new varieties and the way you exploit the land. Yeah. Uh, so it's a total new revolution. So uh, that's natural resources. What the Brazilians are doing with the oil sector is actually quite impressive too, in developing all the, uh, the services and manufacturing associated to the uh, exploitation in the deep, uh, uh, in the deep uh, sea. Uh, so, that's, so you can actually get quite a bit out of natural resources also in sectors, in certain sectors. In manufacturing, of course, you can also do that. And, but curiously enough, uh, some of the manufacturing of Mexico, uh, which is the, the great di uh, diversification, is not, uh, does not have that technological content. I mean, assembling is not a high technological activity, and, and lots of what Mexico does is assembly. Uh, you can say that little Costa Rica, with its uh, ICT sector, yeah. may be doing much more uh, in terms of diversification into high technology than, than Mexico, although Mexico does have pockets uh, 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 of that. And there are many more, more manufacturers that are now standard, you know, uh, you cannot say they are high, te high technological content. I mean, the traditional manufacturing uh, it today has ceased to be uh, uh, sectors of, uh, as, as they were in the past. I mean, let's say producing textiles uh, and uh, apparel uh, was a big technological breakthrough in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, it no longer is. Yeah. Okay. I would just add that I, I think that the key weakness, uh, uh, vulnerability of the Latin American economies has been to base uh, much of our growth, much of our prosperity on factors that are exogenous to us. So the commodity dependence was all, always about that. I think there's two things that we've learned over the past 10 years about how to get out of that. One is what Jose Antonio just mentioned. It's that looking for value added sectors, manufacturing, high tech, and I think there's a lot of progress in different pockets in different countries. The second thing, it, which is something less expected, is that the service sectors and the non-tradable sectors of our economies have started to deliver poverty reduction at an incredible speed over the past 10 years. This is something that we didn't look out 20 or 30 years ago. And today, uh, the, 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 the 57 million people who left poverty of those, it's about 45 million uh, left poverty in the service sectors of our economies, in construction, in sectors that we traditionally consider as low productivity. Now, in the medium and long term, that won't, if we don't upgrade our service sectors, our non-tradable, our popular economies, our informal sectors, we won't be able to sustain those rates of poverty reduction and inequality reduction. So that's the next frontier. We have two motors in our economies now, domestic sector and external sector. And this is something that Jose Antonio always says. If we think about regional integration, uh, there's a lot that Latin America can do and create a single domestic market in the whole southern corn, cone or the whole Latin American uh, region to create those economies of scale, something that we haven't done as much as, as the Asian economies have. I, I, was, I have a number of questions. I want to get to questions from the audience, but I, I want to follow up on that because you mentioned the flying geese model of Asia, but the truth is that that's more than just having Japan lead uh, industrialization or, and development and having others follow, a lot of that was based on sort of bringing along an entire region, investing in a series of uh, chains of production uh, within these countries that then sort of they were able to reverse engineer and bring along. That hasn't happened in Latin America. And it's one of the things that I was interesting in looking at your book was when you talked about uh, export orientation, it was mostly sort of Latin America almost as a channel towards the rest of the world, very little about Latin America as a region and trading and creating those sorts of uh, regional uh, uh, economies of scale within the region. Why is that? Um. You know, as, uh, as George was talking about the flying geese, I said, well, the flying geese work in Asia until the hippopotamus came, right? Mm. Uh, <laughs> which yeah. is China. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so the model, <laughs> so the, now it's not flying geese, it's a hippopotamus, really, that prevails, right? And the, uh, 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 and, and the, and the pattern has totally changed. 
Uh, but the, the way I see it, and, and a big difference with Latin America, because Latin America did not have a flying geese ever, yeah. uh, ever. Uh, you can say uh, some uh, were rapidly uh, becoming exporters of manufacturers since the mid-1960s. Uh, Brazil was, of course, the uh, outstanding example, but so was Argentina, Colombia, you know, to send, uh, Uruguay, uh, Mexico, actually. Mexico uh, was an innovator in uh, export processing zones. The first export processing zones of in 1965 were created in Mexico and Taiwan, you know. <laughs> so it's interesting. So the so Latin America was doing that, but never there were never the linkages uh, that you know others you know like the, you know Japan followed by the the uh, first generation of new industrial countries of, uh, of Asia, let's say Hong Kong, the Singapore, Taiwan, and. And, and Korea, uh, and then this, the second generation, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, uh, there was never like something like that. But the, I think what is important today in, in Asia, is that in, in a sense, is that everyone is integrated with China. So China may be uh, processing for export, but you know, when it processes uh, goods for exports, uh, it has lots of Asian inputs from Japan, from Korea, from uh, uh, Malaysia, from everywhere. So in a sense, all of Asia produces for uh, China, which then assembles and exports to the world. So made in China is really made in Asia, uh, in East Asia. <laughs> now, that hasn't happened in Latin America. You could have thought, you know, who would, could have offered that opportunity? Mexico. But Mexico doesn't even high, have high uh, domestic content of its exports. Uh, and it has no contents, I mean, it has not been an opportunity uh, for other countries to produce for Mexico uh, and then to, for Mexico to export. I mean, Mexico is not the China of Latin America in that sense. Yeah. And I think, it, I, so that's, I think, what it was implicit in uh, George comments that the, uh, that the big difference between East Asia and Latin America is that uh, East, East Asia is really economically integrated in, uh, in, in uh, in the development is these export sectors. Latin America is not. I, each country is on its own. And I think that, that the lack of a, of a regional pattern is actually very costly for Latin America. Do you have any comments on yeah? that? Just one brief thing that we were discussing before uh, coming to this table was that Latin, the Latin American mold is very much the center periphery mold. The idea that we would serve the, the North American economy in the post-war era, and today perhaps the Chinese economy. But the question is, whether we will ever create a center in our own region and create sort of those effects that we're looking for. So that's, I think that's deeply ingrained in the way that we perceive economic policy making and also politics. Yeah. Questions? I want to bring you all. Must plenty to, okay, well, there's a microphone on its way here somewhere. It's coming, there we go, here we go. And introduce yourself and then ask a question. Hi, I'm Becky Rumayor from Latin Trends. And my question is to to both of you about the comparison between Asia and Latin America. And I think part of the, the mix has to be considered the drug trade in Latin America. And I think, I think that's why it was difficult for Latin America to follow the economic development model that sprouted in Asia. Well, I, I don't think the drug trade is, uh, uh, I mean, drug trade is important. Uh, uh, perhaps because there is too much consumption in, in some countries, and, and we pay the cost of producing. Uh, but I, I don't think it's a major driver uh, of, uh, of Latin America, either positively or negatively. Um, this I have, you know, in the past written extensively on, on the issue of drug trade in, uh, in uh, my own country, where is uh, uh, Colombia. And I don't think you can argue that in Colombia it has ever been such a positive force. Uh, it has certainly been a negative force, but in, in many other ways, in, you know, in the financing of all forms of violence. I mean, that's what is the cost of, of, uh, of the drug trade. But you know, the, this issue that the abundance of, uh, of foreign exchange associated to, uh, uh, to the drugs is a major issue, I, I think it's wrong, actually. Most of the money uh, you know, is, is, uh, is really made in the, uh, in the consumer markets. I mean, uh, you can say in, in economic terms, uh, the price of, of cocaine when it arrives, when it leaves, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Colombia or Mexico is, uh, you know, one to two percent of the consumer price. So that means that 98, 99 percent of the 
could, what we call is called value added, uh, is made mostly in the in the consumer markets. So, so the, most of the money has actually been generated here, not in Latin America. So that's why there's not that huge amount of money. Of course, many fortunes are, do, are, are made in the intermediation, uh, and that, uh, those are the cartels, the famous cartels, which have made so much, gave you know, made so much damage to Latin America. Yes, please. Ismael, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right Thank you. Side. Ismael Betancourt, Bronx Transformation Project. Did the U.S. have any kind of, uh, what is the factor, if any, that the, you found in your book that the U.S. played in terms of region, regionalization or non-regionalization in Latin America? Well, the, the U.S., of course, has a, a I mean, w we, we developed the, uh, the role of the U.S. In, in, uh, in different ways in different periods because it's not a constant story. Uh, to start with, the, in, uh, let's say, the 19th and early 20th centuries, is essentially the rise of the U.S. and uh, of uh, links with the, uh, uh, of Latin America to the U.S., in which uh, the two countries that are uh, most important for the U.S. Uh, are Mexico and Cuba uh, in terms of investments and uh, so. Uh, uh, and then, but then the U.S. is able to attract, uh, a, you know, increasing number of countries. So, for example, uh, Colombia or Venezuela, uh, let's say, shift to, to, towards service in the U.S. market in the early 20th century. So by the, by the time of the uh, Great Depression, uh, you know, the U.S. Is, is already the most important market for, uh, for all economies, with the exception of the South, uh, the Southern Cone and Brazil. Uh, so that's, that's one. Uh, now, it's interesting what happens uh, later on. Um, uh, for example, the, the U.S. Uh, plays a very positive role uh, on, the, on the Roosevelt, uh, 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 particularly in the Second World War because of the uh, efforts uh, of the U.S. to attract, to attract uh, Latin America to the uh, allies uh, and avoid the, uh, you know, the uh, association of some countries uh, notably Argentina with the Axis, uh, so that is important. So there are many lots of initiatives uh, during the Second World War that show, you know, the uh, how important Latin America uh, had become uh, for the U.S. in that period. Is the uh, Inter-American Coffee Agreement, the, the first initiative for Inter-American Development Bank, uh, the uh, renegotiation of the debt uh, defaults. Uh, of the 1930s uh, on very favorable terms. I mean, there are many th good things. Actually, the support through the Export-Import Bank uh, to the industrialization of Latin America, uh, the attraction of, of, of several multinationals from the U.S. to produce manufacturing in Latin America. It's interesting. It's a very positive period. Then comes, then uh, Latin America just falls out of the radar of, of the U.S. Uh, for at least 15 years uh, until the Cuban Revolution uh, tells the U.S. Uh, that you should not forget about Latin America. And then comes the Alliance for Progress, uh, a new uh, period of support for, for Latin America, uh, which has some you know, positive uh, attributes. Uh, so you, you can say it's, it's, it's a process that goes uh, in a very uneven way uh, uh, through history. Uh, and, uh, and you can say, of course, in, the, uh, uh, you know, in other ways. For example, one interesting story that uh, is only partly in the book, I don't think actually about is the attitude of the U.S. towards Central American integration. Okay, um, uh, the U.S. Uh, opposes that Central American integration. Uh, it goes ahead uh, because of the Latin American support to it. Um, uh, so the uh, again, that, that's a period of uh, lots of ambivalence and that, uh, uh, of the U.S. towards uh, 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 that was the fifties. <laughs> Uh, so it, it depends on the period you see a, a U.S. which has a positive attitude uh, uh, or entirely ignores Latin America. So it's a, it's, it's a you know, it's a succession of, uh, let's say, of those uh, Bipolar years. Bipolar relationship with Latin America. Yeah. We also uh, talk a lot about the debt crisis and the role of the U.S. in the debt crisis, uh, in which, uh, I, you know, I guess the impression is that the initial phases uh, were terrible for Latin America. The, uh, uh, we actually, uh, I mean, the, the, the words I wrote there uh, are a bit hard because the beginning of the crisis, the, let's say 1982 to 1985, 
Uh, you can really talk about the cartel of creditors organized by the U.S. government uh, with the support of the IMF. Uh, and they negotiated with, the, uh, with individual countries separately. And they, they, they were blocked by all possible ways, uh, you know, Latin American countries getting together to negotiate. Uh, I think that's, a, that's a, a, an accurate description. Then the U.S. takes a positive attitude uh, with the Baker and particularly the Brady Plan. So the, the, uh, it's ter because the first phase is clearly saving the banks, so avoiding the U.S. banking crisis. Uh, in the second phase, when it realizes that, that, that Latin America has entered such a you know, great you know, uh, contraction, uh, then uh, it, it shows that Latin America has to shift uh, to growth. And, uh, uh, and that's the, ba the Baker plan, and particularly the Brady plan, that then uh, uh, serves to cut the, uh, to reduce the Latin American debts. Um, you, right there, yeah. Juan Claudio Lechín. Um, while you were explaining uh, the, the countries with a more steady growth, economic growth in Latin America, uh, you mentioned uh, four countries, if I'm not mistaken. What? Four countries, if I'm not mistaken. Chile, uh, Costa Rica. No, steady growth is Colombia. Colombia. And then the second category, Panama. Uh, Costa Rica and Panama. Yeah. I found Chile is not. It's not. I found in those three, I don't know, Panama, if there is a relation, if you find a relation between political steadiness uh, with uh, economic growth, no, is there I, I, I really don't a think relation? So. I really don't think so. The, uh, except perhaps for Costa Rica, which, uh, which is a country with lots of political stability, uh, uh, let's say for six decades. Uh, in the 20th century, and, and of course has a long history of relative political stability. But, but Panama, for example, or, or even Colombia, don't have the, the kind of political stability that we, you uh, would associate to that. You know, there are, there are, uh, you, you could perhaps argue that in some other period, but even that it is, it's hard to argue that you know, periods of greater political stability were associated to fast growth. I mean, there are probably some cases in which that's correct. Uh, Mexico, for example, during uh, from the 1940s to the 1970s is a case of political stability, not the political stability many people like, but you know, it was a political stability, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was a period of very fast growth. But for example, Brazil during that period was not a case of political stability. And it was a booming, Latin, you know, the fastest growing Latin American economy. So I, I'm not totally sure that you can associate long periods of political stability with, uh, uh, by the way, in the early independence periods, uh, it, it's also the same story. For example, Chile, which is a case of political stability early on, is one of the success stories uh, in the post-independence period. But the other case, Argentina, is a total chaos, and it, and it grows very well. <laughs> it still is, actually. It's, it, 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 you know, it took a half a century to, to build uh, Argentina politically. And it's a success story economically. <laughs> so even during that period. So, so, it's, um, so I don't think there's quite a good association between political processes and, and economic growth. One of the things you talk about, I want to sort of ask you to look forward a little bit, is you talk about the sort of, the, 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 the sort of, uh, sort of constant uh, booms and busts. And you look at those and, and using new data. Let me just put it bluntly, perhaps a little bit crudely, when is the next bust coming and what do you think will cause it? <laughs> and I'm going to take this down and tell my stock <laughs> right. um, Well, you know, we have a, we have a graph which has uh, the frequency of crisis yeah. uh, <laughs> since, uh, since the 1820s, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it shows uh, four peaks uh, historically, okay? The first one is uh, the mid 19 the, the mid 1830s. Okay, the mid 1830s, which is when uh, when Latin America cannot pay the independence war debts. <laughs> yeah. So that's one crisis. Then we have a, a second crisis, which is really international, uh, which uh, starts in uh, 1873, which is the beginning of the what the British in, in the British history is called the Great Depression of Britain, which is really a period of uh, deflation. A long period of deflation that lasts for more than two decades. 
Uh, that is also a cluster of, of banking, of uh, financial crisis. Uh, with interestingly, uh, one uh, important case during that period being Peru, which had been a booming economy with Guano, yep. and uh, had been a very successful economy uh, uh, of that. Then the, the, uh, uh, there, there are other interesting cases. The, for instance, the, the 1890 crisis, which is called the Bering crisis, yep. uh, has its center in Argentina. But it's very, constant, uh, you know, it's very concentrated in Argentina, Uruguay. Does, it's not a Latin American crisis, let's say. But then, the, so the second, cl the the third, the two worst clusters of crisis are the 1930s and the 1980s. And you can say, yes, there is a bit of also in the late, you know, during the Asian the crisis, there is a little bit of, but uh, that's weaker as a regional crisis. And during this global financial crisis, Latin America is not there. So it's interesting. So that Latin America maybe has learned to manage crisis. I mean, it's a good. I, I don't think uh, the risk of a financial crisis uh, is a real risk for Latin America now. What is a risk, I think, is what is happening uh, uh, right in, in, in another sense, which is uh, the uh, very strong appreciation trends that the commodity course, producers, the commodity producers, are experiencing in South America. So. Uh, if, if I may say, the, uh, the risk of a Dutch disease is much more important for, for South America in particular <coughs> than the risk of, uh, of financial crisis. Dutch disease, for those who uh, don't know the term uh, or the jargon of economics, uh, refers to, to the country that, uh, that de, de industrialized because of a natural resource boom, uh, which is called Dutch because of the, uh, the discovery of Netherlands of <laughs> Of um, you know uh, gas, uh, which generated the uh, the uh, deindustrialization in the Netherlands, uh, but it's a common phenomenon that happens. And I said that is probably a more important risk, which has to do with this issue uh, of not being able to to uh, to uh, to sembrar to, to see gas or to see oil. the gas or oil or copper or <laughs> and in any country, I mean even your country Colombia which is doing very well but is also seeing because of a boom in, in, in mining in, in oil uh, is, is experiencing a appreciation of its currency uh, yeah is Colombia, anyone spared? Is, anyone Colombia doing it is clearly one of those cases because I mean you look at the patterns of growth last year in Colombia uh, we have a boom of uh, the mining sector construction and financial services reduction in industrial production and a very slow growth of agricultural production. Yeah. So it's a very imba uh, imbalanced growth, yeah. very imbalanced growth. I mean, when you compare it, for example, with the growth of Colombia in 2003, 2007, was, you know, that period was much more balanced in, uh, in the composition, the sectoral composition. So, I mean, that's what I've been writing in Colombia about that, you know, it's a, uh, you know, you really, I mean, there is really no effort to, to uh, 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 may, maybe the, uh, the boom is being invested in infrastructure in some countries. I think that's, that's correct. But not in the, uh, in the other sectors that would replace the natural resources uh, after this boom. Uh, so I think that we're living again w uh, under the, uh, the mirage that we have always lived, that you know, these natural resource booms are forever. Yeah. And they're not. History tells us that they are not. Jimmy comments? Yeah. Ju yeah. Just uh, quickly, I think the lesson we learned from the 1980s and the 1990s in time of crisis is that we couldn't count on the IMF and we couldn't count on the bond markets. So now, over the past decade, we have self-insured. We have massive uh, central bank reserves. We've had uh, fiscal surpluses. Uh, we've had macroprudential uh, policies for our own banks. Uh, but that is just, uh, and we've seen that you know we've weathered the 2000, 2008, 2009 uh, storm with that. But I think there's two undercurrents there. One is the appreciation of exchange rate that it will affect our tradable sector. But the other thing is consumption and cheap credit and real estate bubbles and construction bubbles. And this undercurrent, which actually feeds a, a growing economy, is something that we haven't uh, dealt with yet. And I think that's something is that uh, the cycle slows down in the future, and it will inevitably. We'll see how those two combine and uh, see the, the, the joint effect of that. I didn't intend to end on a negative note. Let me just say generally the book is very positive. Um, <laughs> I want to give you time to sort of talk to the authors and the discussant. Uh, the books are for sale uh, in the back as well as, uh, if I can just give a shameless pl plug, uh, Copies of America's Quarterly, the, uh, the policy journal we publish here. Um, and uh, please join us for a reception. Please join us. Uh, Jose Antonio will be available to sign the book. When's the movie coming out? 
Thanks a lot, Lee.